Welcome to the Independent Sage Friday briefing. On Monday, the government announced its roadmap out of lockdown. The plan, which the Prime Minister has said is cautious but irreversible, will allow the slow reopening of public life, beginning with schools on the 8th of March. By the 21st of June, the government is hoping that all limits on social contact can be lifted. Independent Sage has published a new report on the roadmap, which Professor Susan Mickey will introduce shortly. Now, the Prime Minister has also stated that there is no credible route for a zero COVID Britain, but Independent Sage, which has been calling for a zero COVID approach for over eight months now, strongly disagrees with this. Aiming for zero COVID is essentially the best way to avoid more unnecessary deaths and more lockdowns. So we've got a lot to get through today, but first, as always, we look at the latest figures with Professor Christina Pargel. Over to you, Christina. Thank you. Um, right. So um, welcome to today's briefing. Um, the headline is that things are continuing to get better, but the rate of reduction in infections is slowing and the impact of inequality is still stark. So actually today, although I'm going to cover the first four things, I'm going to do it reasonably briefly um, and spend quite a bit of time concentrating on inequality and just and just kind of explaining how it um, kind of interacts with with COVID. So um, on deaths, this is the um, ONS data, which is um, people who've got COVID on their death certificate. Um, in the last week, almost 90% of people with COVID on death certificate also had COVID as actually the underlying cause of illness. So they are dying because of it. Um, they are now coming down reasonably um, quickly here in the week to the 12th of February. That reduction is continuing in the 28 reported deaths, um, 28 day reported deaths, which is the most recent, the most up to date measure. So deaths are definitely on the way down. But we can see that the second peak has been longer um, than the first and, and quite severe. And if you look at just the, the total number of deaths in each of these, you can see now in the second wave, we've had you know, about 14, 15,000 more people died um, than in the first wave peak. So it has been a really bad um, second wave that we are now thankfully coming out of. Looking at hospitalizations, um, this is good news. The number of people in hospital um, in all the UK nations is continuing to fall and continuing to fall quite fast. Um, everywhere except Northern Ireland and Wales are now below their April peak and, and I think Wales and Northern Ireland will be there by next week. So that is good news. And we see that in admissions, admissions are still continuing to fall as well. So looking at cases, this is the number of new UK confirmed cases by reported date. This is people who have had a positive test for COVID um, across the UK. And you can see this is still coming down, but you can see it has kind of started to slow. So this, um, it looks like it's flattening off slightly. If we look at it by nation and we're looking at it, um, we're gonna look at it by, oh yeah, I was just, okay, so it's a 12% drop over the previous week. And it was 17% drop the week before, and it was 23% the week before that. So you can see, like, although things are still coming down, they're coming, the, the, that rate of decline is, is slowing now. If we look at positivity rates, this is the uh, everyone who tests, who has a test, how many people test positive, and that kind of takes account of any differences in number of people being tested. You can see that things are still getting better, but you can see here that Scotland and now England and Wales are kind of flattening off that, that, that the kind of rate of decline is getting less, but less so in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is still going down quite steeply. Um, however, the ONS infection survey, oh, I'll just say this before this. So I have shown in previous weeks, actually looking at local authorities within nations. I'm not gonna show it this week because I wanna spend more time on inequalities. But this is all consistent with these patterns. So in Northern Ireland, pretty much every local authority has seen a drop week on week in positivity. In Scotland and Wales it, and England, it's much more mixed. So you are now seeing a kind of mixed picture of some places going up and some places going down, which is what you would expect if not everywhere is declining. The um, 
ONS infection survey released today paints a more positive picture where it shows that the people testing positive for COVID are coming down in every nation. So you can see that here, this is also going down. But ONS measures something a bit different. So it measures at a random point in time whether someone tests positive for COVID. And so it catches people at the end of their illness as well as at the beginning, whereas the case numbers capture people near the beginning of their illness. And what that means is that at the start of lockdown, the ONS was, was slower to see a decline because they were catching people at the end. And I think now that's probably a bit slower to catch the slowing down. It's kind of what I suspect is happening here. So it is measuring something slightly different to the kind of incidence data. If we just look at the English regions by positivity rate, so again, the percentage of people tested who are positive, you do now see this pattern emerging where the lowest rates are now in the London, in London, the east of England and the south of England, and the highest rates in the north and the Midlands. And you can also see that here, things are pretty flat now that they're kind of not going down that much. And that's something I'm gonna come back to um, later. Um, and again, the ONS infection survey, when you look at it by region, also shows exactly this, that it, things are higher in the North and the Midlands and the rate of decline is slower. The vaccination data is good. So this is um, the number of first and second doses given every day in the UK to the 24th of February. Um, we have had a slight slowdown this week to almost two and a half million people received a dose. Um, compared to about 3 million in the previous two weeks. Hopefully that will start coming up again, but it's still a high number. And the reason I'm just showing this is you can now see these orange bits as second doses. And you can see that after weeks of pretty much everyone getting a first dose, we are now starting to give more people second doses as they come up to their 12 weeks. And over the next month, you should see that proportion continuing to increase. Um, about a quarter of the population in each nation has now received at least one dose. Um, so that's very positive. Um, and we can see, so just bear in mind that NHS England show you data by age group and they also give you the population estimates by age group, but those estimates aren't perfect. And so it's not the case that 100% of people who are 75 to 79 will have had their first dose because those estimates aren't perfect. But what it does show you is that a very, very high proportion have. Um, so in general, actually the uptake has been really, really, really good. And you can see here that the over 80s are now starting to get um, more second doses. The, um, the next two groups, so this is group five, 65 to 69 year olds or three quarters of them roughly have already received their first dose. And this 16% of under 65 year olds, that includes healthcare workers, care home workers, and people in group four and group six who have other health conditions. So that's now starting as well. And this week is quite exciting because Public Health England and Public Health Scotland have both released preliminary findings of fa vaccine efficacy. So they obviously know who's been vaccinated um, and, they, and they look and follow them through and see okay, well, how do people who've been vaccinated compare to people who haven't in terms of getting COVID or getting um, being in hospital with COVID? This is um, from the Public Health England data, and it looks at, oh, and it looks at um, the number of people who got COVID after a vaccine, which is this blue line, and it compares it to what they should have happened, what would have happened to them without a vaccine, they do that by kind of what's called case matching. So this is um, this orange line. And you can see that the blue line is very different to the orange line. And it starts at 14 days after your first dose, because that's how long it takes for the, for the dose to start giving you some protection from COVID. So it looks like after a first dose, you are about 50% less likely to catch COVID. And it looks, and that effect continues up to as far as they can look so far, which is about seven weeks. So that's good news. Public Health Scotland um, also suggested that the first dose not only stops you getting COVID, but if you did get COVID, it's much less severe. And so it looks like it's somewhere between 60 and 75% effective at present, preventing hospitalization up to six weeks later, which is the limit of the time um, interval available. So that's also good news. And this is in older populations 
where people were a bit worried that it might not work as well, but it looks like it is working well. So this is all really positive news. So now to kind of look at inequality. And the first thing I wanna do is just explain how it's often measured um, in the UK and it's called um, the index of multiple deprivation and it's measured at what's called the MSOA level, which is a neighborhood level. It's about 7,000 people. And you have these kind of domains of deprivation that take into account things like income, employment, education, health, and it's done at a kind of postcode level. And what they do is they rank all of these neighborhoods across the whole country from the top to the bottom. And then they split them into five equally sized sections. And so the bottom 20% are called like your most deprived um, neighborhoods and then the top, um, the top ranked ones are your least deprived. And what you do is then you have these kind of equal segments of the population in these groups. And if you look at another outcome like income or um, life expectancy or something, if there's no impact by deprivation, you would expect to see equally sized chunks. But if there is an impact by deprivation, you'll start seeing um, it skewed either towards most deprived or towards least deprived. And that's kind of typically how you'd look at it. So that's what we're gonna be doing. So if we look at the average case rates per 100,000 people per week since, um, since the 1st of September, and this is calculated at this neighborhood level, what you can see is that the case rates are much higher for the most deprived areas compared to the least deprived areas. And it's a very kind of consistent pattern, like the, <laughs> the less deprived you are, the fewer cases of COVID you have. And once you have, um, and the worst thing about this actually is that in lockdown, it gets worse. So this is um, the most recent data. So this is December um, when most places weren't in lockdown except from the end of um, December, London and the Southeast were. And this is the national lockdown started in January. And what you see is this kind of differential impact of lockdown where you get this very clear pattern that you have more cases among more deprived communities. And that's simply because often they have jobs that mean they can't work at home, so they're more exposed. And also it's harder to self-isolate and often people are in poor housing. And I'll talk a bit more about that later, but you can see here that the impact of lockdown makes, um, makes the impact of deprivation worse. And once you have COVID, there's also a pattern of deprivation in how sick you get. So this is the total um, admissions to intensive care with COVID from March last year to the 19th of February this year um, by deprivation level, which is reported by the National Intensive Care Audit. And again, you can see that the number of people who are admitted is definitely skewed towards the more deprived populations. And if we look at it um, kind of together, you can see here, you have the population where you have this equal spacing. In the COVID-19 cases, you get the starts to skew towards more deprived populations. And in ICU admissions, it's even more skewed. And what that's saying is that not only um, are more deprived areas, people in more deprived areas more likely to get COVID, they're also more likely to get sick if they do get COVID. And recently the Oxford modeling study um, that was used to actually rearrange the vaccine priorities also found that ethnicity and poverty together are COVID risk factors, both for getting it and for getting sick from it. So what are some of the factors that kind of cause this impact? So part of it is the risk of being a key worker and a key worker is not just people who work in hospitals, it's also teachers, but it's also taxi drivers, security guards, retail assistants, people working in factories, people working in warehouses. And the Office of National Statistics has consistently found that those professions are more likely to get COVID because they're more exposed, but they are also more likely to come from deprived and BME populations. So this is from ONS data. So you can see here that key workers are more likely than average to be from ethnic minorities, to be women, to be born outside the UK as well. And 15% of people are at moderate risk because they have a health condition. So they're also in less good health, which is also related to deprivation. And we know we've spoken about this a lot, but it does really matter. Part of it is that if you cannot afford to self-isolate, then you won't do it. And not only does that put you at risk, if you're sick, you're going out to work and you shouldn't be, it also means you're more likely to infect others in your community 
And because they're in your community, they're also more likely to be um, deprived. Not being able to self-isolate also means that you don't want to get the test because once you have a positive test, you have a legal obligation to self-isolate. And if you can't afford to do it, you actually have a disincentive to get tested. And this is something that Dido Harding, who runs Test and Trace, brought up only um, a month ago. Um, and we saw that in the COVID Liverpool mass testing pilot, where actually the people in the poorest areas are much, much less likely to get a test. We also know that there's a lot of evidence now coming that COVID-19's impact on health is also linked to housing. So part of that is exposure that, that the REACT study that Imperial does has consistently shown people living in multi-occupancy households are at more higher risk of getting COVID, even once you take everything else into account. And part of it is that poor housing in general is linked to poorer health, which means you're more at risk if you do get COVID. And then another thing that I think is important um, is that COVID-19 has highlighted that there's a very unequal access to quali high quality green spaces among different areas with different deprivation levels. And particularly now as we're coming into summer and coming out of lockdown and we're opening up um, outdoor spaces, this matters, right? And it means that some communities will not have the same access to be able to do that. And obviously that matters for mental health, but it also matters because it means people might end up mixing in more unsafe spaces and indoors instead of if they don't have good outdoor places to go to. Um, and how does this all kind of fit in together? Well, this is a map of case rates back in October last year. And I've chosen this partly because it's the same scale as now. And you can see that cases were very concentrated in the Midlands and North, in the Central Bay in Scotland, and then Northern Ireland. If we look at this now, this is um, the most recent map, the same scale, you can see that things, firstly, things are better. We're now at lower case rates than we were in mid-October. That's really good. But you can start seeing that, again, the concentration is here in the Midlands, in the North, in the Central Belt of Scotland. Northern Ireland and Wales are reducing at a more consistent rate. They don't seem to have these pockets of of high cases. Um, and if you look at the English regions ranked by deprivation, so the number of um, local authorities um, and neighbourhoods in them that, that have high deprivation, you can see there is quite a strong gradient and it is exactly where the cases are highest now and have been highest for the last eight months. It's the Northeast, the Northwest, Yorkshire and the Humber, the Midlands and London. Um, and we can look at this in a different way. This is just a list of the top 30 local authorities in England. Um, by how many days since the beginning of September, they had more than 200 cases per 100,000 people per week. So that's a really high level. So the, the initial action um, over the summer was taken when anywhere got over 50. So there were some local authorities that have been high and under restrictions for months and months and months. And you can see these are very concentrated in the Northwest and the Midlands and Yorkshire. If we now just color in all of those places that are in the top 30 now, right now, you can see a lot of them are back in the top. So for the last month, it was mainly London authorities that were near the top, but now London has come down and we're seeing exactly the same places with these persistent pockets of high cases high again. In Scotland, you get a very similar picture. This is the top 15 um, out of 30 local authorities in Scotland. And again, the places that have been consistently high since September are high still as we're coming out of lockdown. And then added to that, there is a deprivation impact on vaccination. This is the proportion of over 80s by deprivation index. Um, and you can see, although coverage is high everywhere, there's still a clear gradient that the more deprived areas are less likely to take up vaccination or to have been offered a dose. Um, but in vaccination, it it's now seems that ethnicity is the biggest um, factor determining vaccine uptake. And you can kind of see this um, in London, which has quite a high proportion of um, people from black and minority ethnic communities. And you can see the uptake here for the over 80s is much lower in London than it is in all the other regions. And that could potentially be, be why. So just to kind of summarize, um, hospitalizations and deaths are continuing to fall in all nations. Um, cases are also decreasing, but there are signs that that might be starting to plateau. Vaccination is going well. 
and the early data showed a really good efficacy. That's really good. Um, but the unfair impact of COVID-19 on more deprived populations has to be addressed. It seems like it's just been this constant the whole way through. And as we're coming out of lockdown, we're going to risk having exactly that same thing happen again, where you have pockets of high cases in the deprived areas, particularly in the north and the midlands of England. And it's not just the right thing to do to address it. It's also the sensible thing to do, because that leads to more risk of uncontrolled spread in the future and potentially um, new variants emerging. And so that um, is it for me. So I'm now going to hand over to Susan. But I will get up her presentation. Yes, over to Susan to talk about the roadmap out of lockdown. Hang on, I have to just share it. Thanks, Christina. Um, so we're going to, uh, I'll just give you the headlines of a report that we're publishing today, which is in the light of the roadmap that was um, published earlier um, in the week. Um, and the report is called Strategy for COVID-19, Maximum Suppression or Mere Containment. Within the report, there are a couple of things uh, we found to be positive about. Um, first was that measures are introduced in phases with time gaps built in for data informed review, uh, less clear exactly what data and how it would be reviewed. And secondly, uh, prioritizing school opening and also outdoor activity. Uh, being outdoors uh, is 20, at least 20 times less risky than indoors in terms of transmission rates. However, um, there are clear deficits in the approach, and this en endangers the ambition of uh, the route out of lockdown being one way and irreversible. So firstly, uh, there was an absence of an overall strategy over and above vaccination. Um, and what the term we would use to describe this is a strategy of containment. Secondly, despite the talk about uh, caution, um, unlike what's happening in Scotland and Wales, for example, um, opening of schools and colleges is all going to be on a single date without the mitigating or compensatory measures that we have been calling for uh, for many months. And we have a, a report on that topic. And thirdly, insufficient focus on addressing inequality, um, risking turning COVID into what's been described as a disease of the poor. So at this point, we have a, a choice. I think it's becoming very stark. Um, the government is becoming more explicit about its, its strategy being a containment strategy. Um, and there are several really serious problems about this. First of all, it risks new variants of the virus undermining the vaccination program. This is especially so in a population where you have some vaccinated and some not. It also risks future restrictions and overwhelming the NHS, also risks thousands of avoidable deaths and many times more that of uh, long COVID and higher rates in disadvantaged communities, as you've heard about. Now, the alternative, there is a, an alternative. Um, it's sometimes called uh, zero COVID, but people get uh, confused about that. It's sometimes called elimination, but people get confused about that because they think it's eradication. So uh, for now, we're calling it maximum suppression strategy. Now, this has been implemented in many countries uh, successfully in managing COVID, but also protecting economies. So we've got Australia, New Zealand, China, South Korea, Singapore, Vietnam, Uruguay, Finland, Norway. You can see these are countries um, across the world. And what this does, what this requires is driving down transmission levels and then keeping them there driving them down towards zero COVID. And for those people who think that this isn't possible and that somehow these countries listed here are unique and different, um, we will hope to show you uh, the opposite. I'm going to give you the headlines uh, now, but obviously we can go into it in more detail in the discussion. So key dangers of the current containment strategy. One is more of what we've seen last year raising hopes that are very likely to be dashed with mixed messaging again. So we were told data, not dates, uh, great phrase. Uh, I think it may have come from us. Um, when the focus was dates, along with the restrictions that would be lifted for those dates, 
Uh, so that really was giving people mixed uh, messaging. And we know that um, there've been huge numbers of, of holidays booked um, immediately after uh, the report was published. There's also talk about a cautious approach, but also fully opening all the schools and colleges on the same day. And as mentioned before, this is a big gamble. This strategy is a gamble with such high transmission levels. Yes, it's coming down, but it's still high. Um, and as I said, there's this risk of new variants. And as Christina has um, outlined, the strategy of containment um, will increase inequalities. I actually put in the word inequality into the 68-page report, and it wasn't mentioned um, once. Um, there was talk about disadvantage, that's good, but we need much, much more focus on this. Um, so the whole kind of containment strategy, which is basically tolerating rather than suppressing the virus, will hit the most disadvantaged and diverse ethnic minority communities the hardest. Um, both, as we've heard, they're more exposed uh, to catching COVID, also have lower rates of vaccination. Um, and finally, um, what do we mean by uh, maximum suppression? How are we going to achieve it? Well, last week, for those of you who were with us, um, uh, we presented the report saying uh, called a sustainable suppression strategy for keep keeping society open. Um, I'd really commend you to uh, look at it, five pillars. So vaccination for the entire population. So really putting the emphasis in how to get to those communities where um, uptake is lower once approved, uh, including children. Widespread testing, but as we've said so many times, there isn't point testing unless it's followed up, especially with supported isolation, practical and financial support. And that will enable all sections of the community to self-isolate. Um, fourthly, um, no point opening up schools again, opening up workplaces if they're not safe. We need COVID safe environments in all our public spaces. And finally, um, robust international travel measures. Thanks. Thank you very much, Susan. And thank you, Christina, for um, the week's facts and figures as well. And it's time now for questions. So we're going to start with uh, Rebecca Bastin from Nottingham. Rebecca, are you there? Hi, yes, I am. Hello. Hi, uh, thanks for those presentations. That, that was really interesting. Um, and it, my question kind of follows on from, from those, um, something I've been concerned about since I saw the government's roadmap for exiting lockdown. Um, my question is, how severe would you characterise the risk of the emergence of new vaccine resistance strains of the virus as a result of resuming social mixing prior to vaccinating the under 50s? Thank you very much for that question. So something that um, we're worried about, obviously, um, are we going to see new vaccine resistant strains emerging? Um, how much of a concern is that um, in the current situation? Um, Professor Dean and Pille, would you like to take that? Uh, yes, thanks. Great question. And um, indeed, this is a concern. I mean, you've asked specifically, is it a concern? Um, definitely. And, and um, I think there's universal concern amongst all those um, in government, in science, um, in epidemiology, um, and in, in those involved with vaccine development and rollout. There's definitely a concern that, um, and that concern is based on what we've seen so far. This is not a theoretical concern anymore. It's a very real concern because we have seen the emergence of these variants. Now, the, the variants that, that are circulating that appear to be have ha, uh, appear to be partially resistant or, or to, to vaccines um, are, have appeared in the absence of vaccine rollout, really. This has happened because these, these, these viruses also uh, are escaping the normal antibodies that we you know, that we will produce following natural infection. Um, but with increasing vaccine rollout and the specific antibodies that the vaccine generates, then, you know, I think there's a heightened risk now that these existing variants will continue to evolve or new variants developing, which will specifically escape somewhat the vaccines. 
so yes, I, I would agree with your with your uh, uh, assertion that this is a risk. Having said that, um, uh, these variants um, do not necessarily lead to a vaccine which is completely ineffective. Um, when you get variants of viruses in this way, um, then it's sort of more of a grey area than black or white. Um, and that's why I think uh, uh, that's why at the moment we would con continue to support the active take up of vaccine. And of course, the quicker that is done together with, as Susan has outlined, the, the maintaining that reduction in number of cases um, and, and viruses circulating, that's the optimal way in which we're going to maximise the effectiveness of current vaccines. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean and, and Professor Anthony Costello. Yes, Rebecca, and until yesterday, I was under the impression that um, variants could lead to greater transmission, but that gradually I picked up from reading stuff that you would end up with a, a less virulent uh, virus, that in other words, gradually it would become more mild and it would solve the problem for us. But actually, last night at our meeting, Dean and Pillay and Kit Yates both showed me that, that actually that's wrong, that the, the virus will mutate in order to transmit, not in order, but will be selected out for better transmission. But whether it kills you a bit more or not is of no interest to the virus, because actually most people will survive and spread it on. So that worries me a bit more that, you know, again, allowing variants to happen could increase the potential fatality rate of the virus as well. I think I'm right. I'm not a virologist. Thank you, Anthony. But um, Dean is a, is a virologist, so we've, we've heard from him. Um, would anybody else like to comment on the emergence of uh, new variants? Something that is um, of a concern. I think, again, if we're talking about a containment strategy, um, Professor Susan Mickey, I don't know if I could come back to you. You've, you've elegantly outlined for us why you think a containment strategy is a, is a gamble, and presumably this is part of the reason. Um, given I'm not a virologist, I won't uh, <laughs> say anything more than, than what I said before. OK. Uh, can I come back to you then, Dean? And Yes, yeah, so so um, I, on um, on behalf of Anthony and Susan and the rest of the the team who claim they're not virologists, I would just um, say this really reaffirms our view. And I said this is a view that's shared by um, um, many uh, thought leaders around the world that we need to roll out the vaccine at the same time as keeping levels of infection as low as possible and this is in order to reduce the risk of emergence of uh, viruses that will compromise the vaccine number one but but conversely this is the way we maximize the impact the positive impact of the vaccines that are being rolled out so effectively in the uk by the nhs um, and we want to encourage more and more people to actually take it up um, we want to ensure that there's enough information for all groups within society not to be um, not to be concerned. Um, there's a lot of social media noise about uh, potential um, side effects and negative um, stuff about vaccines. That that I, I want to reaffirm our view that we really want vaccine rollout to occur as quickly as possible at the same time as keeping infections low during that period of time. Thank you very much for the question and thank you, um, Dean and, and the other respondents there. And I'm delighted that we're joined by uh, MP Leila Moran now. So Leila, uh, what's your question? Um, hi everyone. Well, actually you were, you were beginning to answer it um, and I'm glad I joined in for the, for the end of that because I think we are politically at a crossroads. Um, I found it really interesting and I'm sure you will have all noticed that um, Boris Johnson specifically chose to shoot down zero COVID in his remarks to Parliament, um, whilst of course willfully uh, misinterpreting what, what that actually meant. Um, and so I think the rebranding of the strategy that the all party group did, I think was the right move. And so we call it, you know, COVID secure UK rather than zero COVID because actually 
it was a more helpful way of expressing what the sort of three stages of that strategy are. Um, but I guess what what I and and, and your your um, discussion just now on variants is is I think really important to be having more with the public too. I mean, I've been thinking about what are the two, what are the ways that we can encourage the public to come round to the idea that it's not vaccination equals passport to uh, freedom, which is a whole other thing that we might want to also discuss, but uh, in terms of uh, the, the way out of this virus. And actually I, I'm really concerned right now that actually we are headed towards more of the same strategy that is gonna lead to a fourth wave now, one of the things I've regretted over the last three, um, every time that they have come out of the lockdowns, we've predicted a further wave and a further lockdown. Um, this one feels different because of the vaccine, but to what extent could we say at this, you know, what if we if we were able to put a sort of confidence interval on, we can expect another wave next autumn how confident would we be about that at this stage? Because if we are, then I think we kind of need to go harder, or I say we, from the political side, need to be, go a bit harder and a bit more confidently with that assertion this time, given that actually I think the public are in the space of recognising that Boris Johnson does consistently over-promise and under-deliver. Um, and if we do think that actually there are aspects of this strategy that they're getting wrong, not least bringing all children back on March the 8th when it should have been a phased return. Um, they're not going for a, a strategy that's encouraging R to go down. In fact, they're, they're relying on so-called headroom and hoping it's not going to get exponential again. I mean, I can see flaws in you know the back door of quarantine with people flying in and out. And that's only going to get worse as people are encouraged to finally book summer holidays. Um, to what extent can we predict that fourth wave, that fourth lockdown, and actually use that as a way of kind of getting in to uh, the consciousness of people that this is not going to be over soon? Thank you very much, Leila. Professor Christina Pargel. So one thing to say is that the, the SAGE modelling subgroup um, released a paper, well, it was one of the, in their notes a couple of weeks ago, where they specifically said that under a containment strategy, there's almost certain to be another wave. Now, the timing depends a little bit on exactly what happens and, and how vaccination goes, but there will be one. And they've said somewhere between 30 and 80,000 more deaths by the end of June. Um, so that's one bit of evidence that comes directly from the government's own scientific advisors. Um, I would say the one way to try and explain the benefits of a suppression strategy or COVID Secure UK is that it doesn't require a longer lockdown necessarily. It just requires you to add on to the vaccination programme the measures that we've outlined, which is, you know, proper support for isolation, supporting more deprived communities where cases are stubbornly high, making schools safer, having a, a more phased return to school, things like that, that just make it much easier to keep cases down. They don't necessarily mean you have to stop opening. It's just so frustrating because it's, it's not that much more difficult to go to a suppression strategy from the containment strategy that they're doing now. Um, Professor Gabriel Scali, I know you wanted to come in on this and then I'll come to you, uh, Dr. Zubeda Hack. So, Gabriel. It's a good question, uh, Leila. I, I, I mean, but it's a difficult one to answer with any precision. And, and it's, it's almost wrong to expect precision on it because it is a, a risk. It, it really is a risk. The very fact that we're talking about it shows that it is a risk. And what makes it a risk? Those are the areas that we should be addressing to try and minimize that risk completely, irrespective of whether it's a huge risk or a low risk. The, the changes that are needed, things that the government needs to do, remain the same. And the things that they need to do are the things that they haven't done, despite the fact the Prime Minister says we have done everything we could. Uh, they haven't. And uh, Independence Age has consistently listed what needs to be done. And one of the prime things is a, a, a good fine test trace isolation support system. And it hasn't really been put to the government that they are operating way outside international guidance in terms of their contact tracing and their contact testing. We don't test people at high risk. High risk contacts of people who've already tested positive are not tested. They're told to self-isolate and only come forward for testing 
if they develop symptoms. And that's completely wrong because a significant portion of those people will be asymptomatic. And, and it's not in keeping with either the European guidance or the CDC guidance. And why the government persists with uh, a field program that is at the core of any security that we are seeking to build uh, going forward, I don't know. Um, and we also know that uh, immunity as a result of the vaccination program is not going to be evenly distributed because vaccination is not going to be evenly distributed. And why do we know that? We know that because vaccination isn't evenly distributed in any of the, uh, the other vaccination campaigns, uh, uh, programs that we run in the country. And particular places have particularly low levels and particularly London. Uh, London has consistently failed to meet uh, uh, levels of um, immunization required for, for common childhood diseases, for example. And we know that there will be pockets where there will be a lot of unvaccinated people unless the government actively runs a vaccination campaign at a local level and involves communities. So there are a whole load of things that the government should be doing. Um, they shouldn't be running the risk of a fourth wave. They should be doing everything they possibly can to reduce that risk, and they are not. And they are, by, by putting all their eggs in the one basket, they are at great, putting us all at great risk yet again. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, Dr. Zubaida Hackett next, and then I think there's a couple of other people as well, so we'll try and keep it short if possible. The biggest concern, Leila, is that the roadmap is likely to increase inequalities. And the reason it will increase inequalities is exactly as Christina, as my colleague Christina has said, is because this is, this is, this is rather than suppressing the virus, the government are tolerating the virus. And the very communities that that strategy, that strategy of just tolerating the virus, which means tolerating higher levels of cases, will be the very communities it will hit will be the black and ethnic minority communities and deprived communities, just as we've seen in the presentation. Those communities are the most exposed to the virus, but it's in those communities at the moment that we also have lower rates of vaccination uptake. So that is the reason why we want the government to have a suppression strategy rather than a tolerating strategy. Thank you, Zubaida. Dr. Kit Yates, you wanted to say something here as well. Yeah, Leila, you, met, you mentioned schools in particular as, as, as something which is a particular worry. And I think, I think you're right, with schools all going back at once and relatively little being done to actually materially change the probability or the possibility of transmission within schools, it's likely that we're going to see, <clears throat> excuse me, it's likely that we're going to see the reproduction number come above one when everyone goes back to schools. There's a modelling study from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, which suggests that that's the case. And, you know, when R does go above one, that will mean that cases will start to rise. And unfortunately, the roadmap at the moment doesn't have a, a strong criteria or tell us what, what's going to happen when cases do start to rise. There's this fairly nebulous criteria about not having too much pressure on the NHS, but there's no numbers around that. So there's no indication of how we will roll things back, how we will start to um, or stop or stop continuing releasing restrictions or, 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 or tighten things up if we do start to see cases rising and if we do start to see pressure building on the NHS. And, and I think that that's, that's something that urgently needs to be addressed. How will we know when we need to stop opening up? Thank you very much, Kit. And uh, Professor Stephen Reicher, you wanted to comment on this question as well. Yeah. So I think one of the problems we've got here is that the rhetoric of the roadmap is actually very attractive and, it, and we agree with it. We agree with uh, uh, um, data, not data. So Susan said uh, it might have come from us, but we, we won't sue the government for plagiarism. We're not mean that way. Um, Secondly, caution, absolutely, we need to be cautious. And thirdly, irreversible. We all want it to be irreversible. But look at the reality behind that rhetoric. So if we start with data, uh, not dates, the problem is that once you name very clear dates, and it's not coincidental, again, they've gone for a symbolic date of Midsummer's Day for opening everything up, just as they did last year, July the 4th, to get the headlines about Independence Day, and therefore message to people that, okay, we can relax at the very time when we can't. But the problem is once you name those dates, 
you change the facts on the ground. You lead to people booking their holidays. You lead to the opening up of the festivals and people buying their tickets. And so you have such huge pressure, it's very difficult to back off from those dates. So you become, the reality becomes dates, not data. Caution, well, again, as we've all said, opening up the schools in one go, unlike countries elsewhere, like Denmark and Norway, which have opened them gradually with a traffic light system, is not caution. It's the opposite of caution. And again, the modelling suggests that if you open schools in one go, there's a very real possibility, indeed probability, of the R going above one. And as for irreversibility, as we've heard, the danger is that if you move too fast, and if you allow the, uh, the virus to reproduce more, you have a greater probability of uh, the virus undermining the vaccines and us being back to square one. On the other hand, we have seen, because it's worked in a number of countries, that with infection suppression strategies, you can bring the levels of infection to such a low level that if there are outbreaks, you can deal with them in very targeted ways, rather than needing to go for the blunt instrument of, of lockdown. So the reality, sadly, is that this is about dates, not data, or at least it's becoming that. It's not cautious, and it really risks the, ver the, the, the problem of being a two-way street, not a one-way street, and being reversible. And I think we've got to stress much more the realities while actually grabbing that rhetoric and making it our own by saying what needs to be done to make it cautious, to make it about data, and certainly to make it irreversible. Thank you very much, Stephen and Leila. Thank you for your question. Moving on now to some questions from the press. And first up is Nigel Nelson from the Sunday People. Nigel. Hi, thanks, Alice. Um, are there any specific doubts about the AstraZeneca vaccine? I mean, given what President Macron said about its efficacy in the over 65s, and more particularly the fact that South Africa has cancelled the rollout of AZ. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, Dean, and can I ask you for a response on that? Well, putting me on the spot, Nigel, that's a very good question. Um, uh, you know, and, and there's evidence all, always. It, it, it does seem it's early data from South Africa that has led to um, their, their decision. Um, and and I've heard President Macron saying what he's, he's said. I do think we need to take into put this into context is that where countries are making decisions about a, one vaccine or another, that is in the context of what of what supply potential they have. Um, and and so we've we've you know clearly uh, South Africa. I think they're putting most of their eggs in the Johnson and Johnson vaccine that uh, that that was trialed there. Um, and and I, I I think Europe as well is is going to do that. But that may be to do with what the opportunity is for supply. So I don't think we should just oh, we should overinterpret the uh, the utterances of of national governments here um, in in the context of what is the scientific reality. Certainly in the UK. I think, given the data that we're getting now from um, from um, uh, from from the rollout of vaccines, um, I still think it's the right it was the right decision to um, to to give one dose of AstraZeneca. In fact, that the, the evidence is strengthening that waiting for the twelve weeks may be beneficial compared to giving a booster at four weeks. Um, and so, I, I, you know, that's where I, I would sit. And at the moment. Um, I, I would support the AstraZeneca vaccine continue to be used in the UK. Thank you very much. Does anybody else want to comment on vaccines before we move on? Right, then. Next question comes from Alexandra Thompson. Alexandra. Hello, everybody. Um, just talking about these inequalities that you flagged, last night at midnight, the government published its second report on COVID-19 disparities. And just reading from the press release, it says, comparing first and early second wave data, disparities have improved for some ethnic groups, including Black Africans, Black Caribbean, Chinese and Indians, but have worsened for Pakistanis and Bangladeshis. So, 
The government's saying there is signs of improvement for some ethnic groups. Do you have any insight on why Bangladeshis and Pakistanis may be faring worse still? And is the government's definition of improvement still lagging behind for you compared to people of a white ethnicity? Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Um, can I come to you, Dr. Zubaida Hack? Um, I can kick off. I don't know if my colleagues want to um, add to this. So, um, first of all, we need to remember that actually the risk factors for black and ethnic minority groups, while it may have reduced for some in wave two, uh, has increased for others, but also it's it's still very high. It's still higher than the white population. It's still higher in deprived communities than, than in the more advantaged communities. And that's really important to remember. Um, I think the government is implying that um, that they have been, um, it's because of interventions that they've done in, in the first wave and the second wave that it's improved for some ethnic groups. And certainly the implication is, therefore it can't be to do with race or ethnicity. Actually, it may be to do with the fact that some of the groups are less likely to be working now. We know that jobs have hit black and ethnic minority groups disproportionately high. It may be that the job losses are in black African, black Caribbean, and Chinese groups, so they're less likely to be exposed to the virus. But we also, Bangladeshis and Pakistanis, are much more likely to be poorer. There are much higher rates of child poverty among Bangladeshi and Pakistani groups, around 60%, compared to around half for black groups. Um, and also that they're likely to live in overcrowded and multi-generational housing. Now, all of those factors, being poorer, being in low paid insecure jobs, living in overcrowded and multi-generational housing means that those groups are much more likely to remain vulnerable. And we know that Bangladeshis and Pakistanis have been much more likely to die with COVID-19 in wave two. All of that, Alexandra, begs the question, what exactly have the government been, have the government been doing in the last year to minimize the risk for these ethnic groups and why hasn't there been more done thank you very much zubeda um and uh, professor stephen reicher you'd like to comment here as well just very briefly i mean let's remember that this report is about health inequalities and as zubeda has said that in itself is problematic but there are all the other inequalities caused by the pandemic. There are the inequalities in terms of loss of jobs. There are inequalities about the future. And there's inequalities about schooling, which is one which concerns me very greatly indeed. Uh, so for instance, we know that people from more deprived backgrounds and ethnic minorities are sadly more likely to be ethnic, uh, deprived, are more likely to miss schooling and more likely uh, to suffer in terms of the grades they get. One of the things that concerns me very greatly is that all the plans about exams for this summer and about the assessment for this summer say nothing about how you're going to take into account the disadvantage that people have suffered in getting their grades. For instance, being off school because they're unwell, um, having a, a relative who, um, who, who died or who, who got the infection, not being able to study at home and so on. And unless that is taken into account in both uh, giving assessments and taking assessments into account, there is going to be a generational uh, effect of inequality. So I think we've got to be very, very careful to say that the problem of inequalities has diminished at this stage. In many ways, it's getting worse and the actual direct effect upon health is only one small part of the impact of COVID on inequalities. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Professor Anthony Costello, I think you wanted to comment as well. Are you on mute? Uh, one thing that's always troubled me throughout this entire uh, UK management is why the government has shown such little interest in public health measures to address infection control, address inequalities and the like, but lots and lots of interest and money in drugs, vaccines and the like. And uh, one thing I read recently in the Financial Times is that the testing industry is looking forward to about a four billion uh, pound uh, business. And so if I was being cynical, one would say it's much better to have a containment strategy where you let a low level of infection keep going and everyone needs a test and not worry too much about the poorer groups because they're 
less likely to be vaccinated, more likely to be infected and less likely to get a test. But everyone else gets a test, going to a football match, going to a theatre game. And um, it does make me worry that the economic decisions here may be influenced by those factors. But that's my personal opinion, not Indie Sage. Thank you very much, Anthony, and thank you for your question, uh, Alexandra. Uh, now we have somebody who wanted to share their perspective with us. Uh, Stella is from Buckinghamshire. She's 10 years old and in year five and is due to go back to primary school on March the 8th. Stella, how do you feel about going back? Um, so I'm very, very excited to um, see all my friends because I've really missed them over the time that we've been at home. And I'm very excited not to be remote learning because I'm like by myself quite a lot because my parents work. So I'm excited to be actually taught by somebody. And I'm a bit concerned that I may catch coronavirus and spread it on to other people like my mum and dad. And um, the ventilation in our classroom isn't very good because the windows, we're upstairs and the windows barely open due to safety. Thank you very much for sharing that with us, Stella. It's a, it's a worrying time for everyone, isn't it? I wonder if anybody would like to um, respond to Stella. Susan, Professor Susan Mickey. Stella, thanks so much for joining us today. And um, what, what you said is so important um, because the first thing you talked about was the need to have other people, your friends, um, not to be on your own for so long. And this is such an important issue for everybody, but especially for children um, and, and being at school and all the things that you enjoy are so important, not just about your education, but about, as you say, playing and, and being with your friends. So, so important that when the schools open up, and um, I'm, I bet you're looking forward to March the 8th, um, that the schools do make sure that it's safe enough for you all to stay at school, because that's what you want to do, keep being there. Um, and um, you're absolutely right to draw attention to this issue about ventilation of indoor spaces. As time's gone on over the last few months, um, it's become more and more obvious that, that the issue about um, catching the virus through the air is more important than was thought about at the beginning. And that's why doing as much outdoors as possible. So I do hope your teachers allow you to do as much outdoors, especially as the sun's coming out, it's going to get warmer over time. Um, but also, as you say, ensuring that um, as much as possible, there's good ventilation in, inside classrooms. And it, if you can't get the windows open, I hope your school will be able to get the windows open. I mean, at least opening doors is, is something. But um, anyway, great, great to have you here and great to hear what you had to say. And uh, enjoy March the 8th. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. And thank you very much, Stella, for coming along today. Thank you. Moving on now to our next question. It comes from Carla Adam of the Washington Post. Carla. Is Carla there? Okay, I'll try somebody else. I'll try Teresa Gregory from Oxfordshire. Teresa, are you with us? Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes, I can. Um, my question's kind of related to the last one with the children going back on the 8th and parents starting to mix at the school gate and then three weeks later rule of potentially rule of six and households gathering outdoors is there evidence of the increased transmissibility being a factor in outdoor transmission and how should we consider that when we start to exercise outdoors with another person or mingle at the school gates and things like that thank you very much Teresa. do you mean with the new variants the increased transmissibility is that what you mean yeah um who would like to take this question then are we are we concerned about increased transmissibility and does that affect how we interact with people outside as restrictions are lifted professor gabriel scally that's a good question Teresa. i hadn't really thought about that I, and why had i not thought about it i was trying to work it out of my mind and i think it's because 
the differential between indoors and outdoors is really so great. Uh, there is an enormous difference between indoors and outdoors. So increased transmissibility, yes, but it really is small, a small additional risk compared to the, the huge benefit of being outdoors. I, I do think, however, it should give us cause for uh, concern if we are, are in places that are crowded outdoors, if you know what I mean, if, it's, uh, if you're in a busy, uh, busy street or uh, uh, it's all about proximity and it is about the, the free movement of air and too many people. And uh, I mean, my response to the increased transmissibility has to been to change the mask I wear when I'm outside from a, a, a three layer face covering to a, an FFP2 mask, just a more efficient mask. But I don't think it would put me off at all uh, being outdoors. I think uh, uh, particularly when there's a breeze blowing, the, the difference would be very, very small indeed, I think. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Uh, Dr. Kit Yates. It's a really interesting question, uh, and certainly in terms of the increased transmissibility, I think there, there are different reasons why um, variants might be more transmissible. It might be that they're more effective at infecting people. They, they maybe bind better to the cells. It might be that it makes each individual person have a higher viral load. Or it might be that people are infectious for longer periods of time. And that actually, we've seen some evidence recently suggesting that um, that B117, the variant that's in the UK, is more infectious partly because it infects people for a longer period of time. So each of those different things will, will change the, the relative risk of you passing on the, the virus to someone else when you're outdoors with them. If it is a higher viral load, then that will probably increase the chances of, of passing the disease on from, from a single encounter. So it's worth remembering that we should continue to do social distancing, even when we're outdoors with people. It's often sensible to, to wear masks in, in whatever situation is. But of course, um, there are huge benefits to, to meeting outdoors with people, going for exercise, and, and of course, mental health benefits from, from chatting to people who are not in our household that we haven't been able to do for a long time. So I think... The, the, the benefits of being able to meet outdoors will, will out, outweigh these risks, risks as long as we're sensible about how we do it. Thank you very much, Kit. And um, if you will, a brief comment from you, Anthony. No, I was just thinking, because Dina and I are desperate to get back to football matches. But if it's true that there's airborne spread and that outdoor risk has gone up a little bit and you're with 60,000 people screaming and shouting, it is an issue, and one might argue that you should have some kind of big pumps squirting air over the people so that they're clearing uh, away instead of being in these stands. I'm just raising this because uh, it's going to be a big issue. We've got to get back to football, for goodness sake. We're pretty. Thank you, Anthony. And, and, and actually, your comment there also raises the point that not all outdoor spaces are equal. Um, you know, some so in, in some outdoor spaces, you are in um, in essentially quite stagnant air, and in other places, air is passing through and uh, and exchanging. Uh, Dean, and you wanted to comment as well. Just sorry for an in joke, but I, I don't think Millwall would get sixty thousand people, which is um, which is Anthony's team. Um, but but uh, yeah, but um, we shout I, more than Spurs. I, 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 I think there's a nice idea about, you know, trying to increase ventilation outside, but I sort of think we should just still focus on let's get ventilation in our schools and indoor places where people have to be. Um, and, and, and I think the more outdoors we can be, the better. Thank you very much. That kind of Norwegian style of living uh overdue here i think uh thank you very much for the question we're moving on now to joshua askew who is 17 and he's a student at colchester sixth form college and he's going back to school on the 8th of march and has a question for the panel so joshua are you there yes hello um so I'm, i was gonna sort of ask a question about uh, what my school is doing which is blended learning Half the class stays home uh, and watches the lesson and half the class uh, goes in and does it face to face. Um, my school does a, has, um, has taken responsibility and, and done a lot of measures like this, uh, where mandatory mask wearing uh, and the like. Uh, why couldn't all schools do something similar to this? 
thank you josh that's a that's a really excellent um question and um and i think that the reason that a lot of schools couldn't do it in the autumn was that the department for education explicitly told them they weren't to do it um but it's it's actually very um good to hear that there are some schools that are doing that now uh, professor susan mickey would you like to respond yeah sure um john uh, josh it's really good to to hear that that's happening in your schools um and the advantage of um blended learning, as you know, is just to be able to have enough physical distancing um, to keep everyone safe, uh, whilst ensuring that people aren't missing out on, on their education. Um, having said that, we have actually for many, many months been calling on um, the government to uh, really enable schools to have more spaces and bring in more teachers and support staff so that more people can actually um, be at school. And the other um, issue about blended learning is it's all very well if people have got um, laptops at home, have got digital connectivity at home and have got a quiet space to study at home. That's not true of all students. So I think if, if um, we are going to have to move to this um, in the long term, and, and I, as I say, there are other solutions, you know, more space and more, more teachers, um, then it's absolutely imperative um, that um, all children, uh, students be given um, the laptops, the connectivity, but also be, have supervised spaces in um, their neighborhoods where they can go and um, study in a satisfactory way. So I think it has to be um, a package. And also I think it has to really pay attention to the inequalities that we heard about earlier today uh, to ensure that the educational inequality doesn't increase as well as um, other inequalities. Thank you, Susan. And Dr. Talila Oni, you'd like to comment here. Thanks, Josh, for that um, important question. Just to build on, on Susan's point of inequality, I just want to highlight and maybe think through the importance of also thinking about schools that we've all agreed as a priority as part of, uh, well, thinking about um, our, our reopening in an integrated way, and not siloing all the different components. So, we're not, so not siloing what schools, colleges and universities need to do, what um, hospitality needs to do, what, um, what all those different components. And the reason I say that is because where schools require additional support in terms of um, the social infrastructure in the, in the community, there might need to be trade-offs and decisions made about the use of some of the spaces that are not being used at the moment, and that might be opened up um, as, as we go along, um, as we ease restrictions. And so we might need to think about the trade-offs between, technically we could open this up, but we may need it for, to provide more spaces uh, for schools if you see what I mean. So if we think about the hospitality spaces, think about the community spaces, if we think about if our schools around needed more space in order to maintain social distancing, the trade-off might be actually to use those spaces as alternative learning spaces rather than to open them for what they for their original purpose. So I just want to highlight just the importance of that integrated thinking. So we're thinking about reopening not, sep not in separate silos, but actually thinking about a place-based approach um, that integrates all those different components. It's just a small point. Thank you very much, Tallulah. And thank you very much for that question, Josh. Um, I'm going to move on now to, I think, our final question of um, today from Claire Andrews from Ely. Claire, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you, Alice. Um, Asthmatics reliant on daily steroid inhalers to breathe were the only group of patients removed from vaccine priority group six, despite remaining in the clinically vulnerable group as per NHS and government guidelines. Those asthmatics under 50 now face continuing or returning to their workplaces as lockdown eases before being afforded any protection from vaccination. Data used to justify this decision was from a small study last year showing that asthmatics were not at higher risk of dying from COVID-19. However, we know that many of us were voluntary shielding since the start of the pandemic, which might have skewed that data. Newer evidence, however, links asthma clearly to a risk of long COVID, 
and a higher chance of hospitalisation. So why is this clear risk not being used to identify us as a health group more at risk of hospitalisation and placing greater strain on the NHS, especially considering we're so easily identifiable through our annual asthma checkups and being on the annual flu jab uh, list every year? Um, so basically what I'm saying is it's not it's not currently true that the government will have vaccinated all clinically vulnerable people after they finish doing groups one to nine before including asthmatics in that group. So I'd like your opinion about, about what's been going on with that. That'd be great. Thank you very much, Claire. A really important question. And that decision came incredibly late with, with enormous um, in, indecision as well, or, or, or um, bad communication around it. We had several people saying that, um, that asthmatics were going to be in group six and then, uh, and then we were told they weren't. Um, does anybody want to um, respond to that question? Professor Christina Pargel. This is purely a personal <laughs> response because I, I have asthma and I have my daily inhaler as well. And I've been following it and you're saying they were in and then we're out and then we're in and then we're out. So I know that it seems that we're out, except that I got my vaccine this week and that would be the only reason I would have been called in because that's the only risk factor that I have and I'm not, I'm under 50. And I asked, I asked the, the GP when I went in and I said, you know, is this why am I here because of that? And he was, yeah, he was like, well, probably. And I, you know, and I've heard like on Twitter, there are other people also exactly the same who have kind of well-controlled asthma, but take a daily steroid who've also been offered it. So I don't quite know whether some practices are putting in asthmatics in group six. So I don't know. I just know that I have it. And that's the only reason I could have been called to have it. So it's, I mean, it's really confusing. And I think the evidence that you just suggest, I think, they should be because there is evidence that they are at high risk of, of more severe disease even if perhaps not high risk of death thank you very much christina and i should say i'm under 50 and an asthmatic and i haven't been offered a vaccination yet so it's not across the board and i, I don't think many asthmatics under the age of 50 have been vaccinated yet uh, professor anthony costello yeah well christina got it because they're worried that she'll put out some more dodgy data you know so um uh no uh, there are grades of asthma and I just, you know, there are millions of people with mild asthma. So you could argue that it should be up to the GPs to make sure that the severe asthmatics do get vaccinated. And perhaps Christina would be classed as severe, I don't know. But the other thing is, am I right that if you take um, inhaled steroids, it has a sort of mild dexamethasone effect and that there's some evidence that it slightly reduces your risk of um, um, more serious COVID disease. I'm not sure about that. I, I seem to remember reading it, but I don't know if my clinical colleagues have picked up on that. I think there was a suggestion about that at some point. Uh, Professor Dean and Pillay. Well, just in response to uh, to Anthony's uh, point, uh, yes, in, inhaled steroids, not de dexamethasone, but but in, inhaled steroids, but were was found to be within the principal study, which is in uh, as 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 beneficial in early COVID, um, non hospitalized COVID. Just a, just um, so so that's that. But just coming back to Claire's point, I mean. I, I, can't, I can't add anything else. You've, you've sort of very eloquently identified um, what is uncertainty for a large number of people in the UK. Um, and it may be that, that we should invite someone from the JCVI, the Joint Committee of Vaccination Immunisation, on to join us to be able to answer some of these sort of um, more vexed problems as, as vaccination is rolling out and we're then beyond the first four groups. Thank you very much, Claire, for your question, though. Yes, thank you, Claire, and thank you, Dean. And, and at that point, I'm going to draw it to a close um, and I'm going to hand over it to Sir David King for his summary, as usual. Sir David. Well, thank you very much, Alice. Um, I think one, one of the quotations that struck home to me during this uh, broadcast was the a uh, quotation from the SAGE subcommittee on modeling, and almost certain to be another way. And I, I think that really has to strike home to all of us, and in particular to government. It is their advisors saying this. Uh, we have put forward a strategy 
which is a maximum suppression strategy today. And the government's strategy is a containment strategy. And there is a distinct difference between the two. I have to say that I think the government strategy this time around has been a considerable improvement on previous rounds. But, but then I also have to say, it was pretty easy to improve on previous rounds and we have to do considerably more. A maximum suppression strategy is what is operated in other countries which have far fewer cases than us. And the reason they have fewer cases is precisely because they've had that strategy in place. My colleagues always comment that I only ever say one thing and let me say it again when I summarize. We need a fully functional find, test, trace, isolate and support system so that if we do, for example, go into a second wave, we don't have to go into another lockdown. The lockdown is the blunt instrument, which not only means that all of us who are healthy have to lock down and be kept away from other people, but it also is wrecking our economy. So we would all prefer to see that we separate out those with the disease from the healthy part of the population. So the, the six pillars that have been put forward, absolutely essential. And one of them, first and foremost, is vaccinate all. Uh, we, we need to see that we manage a suppression strategy so that we drive this disease down. And finally, let me say, border control. We finally got round to that. We haven't really perfected it, but that is another way of managing the disease. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir David King. And thank you everybody for your questions today. Thank you to everyone who's watching, whether that's live or catching up. Thank you to all the experts on Independent Sage. Everyone is a volunteer making time for this because they think it's important to share data analysis and scientific opinion, but also because they believe it's important for them to hear about perspectives, questions and concerns from the public. The new report on the roadmap and also actually a very useful document on questions about vaccination, which you might find useful, you might want to share that with friends and colleagues. And all the other reports that Independent Sage have published over the months are there on the website, along with details of all the scientists here. Please do follow Independent Sage on Twitter if you don't already. We'll be back same time, same place next Friday. Stay home if you can. Stay safe. Keep well. Thank you, everyone.